we're in a position, as you've identified, where we're supporting Ukraine, but we also don't want to uh, ultimately end up in World War III, and we don't want to have a situation in which um, actors are using nuclear weapons. We perceive that, as I indicated in my statement, as something that he is unlikely to do unless there is effectively uh, an existential threat to his regime and to Russia from his perspective. We do think that um, that could be the case in the event that he perceives that he is losing the war in Ukraine and that uh, NATO, in effect, is sort of either intervening or about to intervene in that context, which would obviously contribute to a perception that he is about to lose the war in Ukraine. I won't try to provide an audit of the destruction wreaked on Ukraine and the destruction of countless lives of not only conscripted young men, but mothers and children, an all too typical quality of unlimited warfare. There is certainly untold levels of suffering. Whole cities appear to have been simply destroyed. Sickening drone footage has shown us all the ravages of unlimited aerial bombardment, indiscriminate shelling, cluster munitions, and the like. We may not know for years the cost. The consequences from launching an invasion on a modern country targeting critical infrastructure and destroying residential areas are long-lasting, as I've covered in my numerous videos about the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Now, we are all well aware of these facts, and I've brought you here for a reason, clearly. What I say in this video may be extraordinarily unpopular, maybe even to my own audience, and definitely to people outside of my audience. If you're willing to stick around, I think with an open mind, you could see that I only make this case for the reason that I sincerely fear for the future of humanity. As multiple observers have opined, we are at the most dangerous period of time since the Cuban Missile Crisis, albeit with far, far less urgency from the public. And that is why I am compelled to speak frankly now. The war in Ukraine was likely avoidable by Putin choosing not to invade, but also, more importantly, had the United States in particular and NATO in general chosen to seriously pursue diplomatic channels for stopping the invasion before it started. In January 2022, exactly one month before the Russian invasion, Charles Maines wrote an explainer article for NPR detailing what Russia wanted out of negotiations. Russia's main demand is a commitment from NATO to end its further expansion into former Soviet republics, especially Ukraine. Russia wants NATO to rescind a 2008 promise that Ukraine could someday join the defense alliance. But the United States refused. First of all, uh, there, there is... Uh... There is no change, there will be no change. The roughly three decades since the fall of the Soviet Union has been characterized by a long series of provocations fomented by the United States and, namely, NATO. It began as early as 1990, when the Soviet Union was on the verge of collapse. As Western and Soviet leaders negotiated the reunification of Germany, the West German foreign minister Hans-Dietrich Genscher declared at a public speech that NATO should rule out an expansion of its territory towards the east. The speech was summarized in a cable written by the U.S. Embassy at Bonn, one of many documents collected by the National Security Archive at George Washington University. The archive also reports that not once, but three times, Secretary of State James Baker assured Gorbachev that NATO would not expand, quote, one inch to the east as did the West German Chancellor a day later. Once again, Secretary Baker assured Gorbachev of his plans in May. British Prime Minister John Major also told Gorbachev that NATO would not expand. And even NATO Secretary General Manfred Werner told a team of Russian Supreme Soviet deputies that he and NATO were against expansion. Thus, Gorbachev went to the end of the Soviet Union, assured that the West was not threatening his security and was not expanding NATO. With the fall of the Soviet Union came a crisis for the defense industry. It was an unusual period of relative peace following the Cold War and preceding the War on Terror. 
After the shipwreck of communism came years of relative quiet, years of repose. Defense contracts fell to about half of what they were a decade earlier. The Army was losing combat units. The Navy was losing ships. The threat of nuclear extinction hardly hung in the air. Something had to be done. By the end of his second term, it may emerge that President Clinton's most enduring legacy in national security will be his role in creating a handful of extraordinarily powerful defense contractors. It was 1993 when Clinton appointed William J. Perry as Deputy Secretary of Defense. That same year, Perry convened a meeting with executives from the largest defense contractors in the country, a shadowy event now referred to as the Last Supper. Perry warned the executives that the post-Cold War budget cuts and the falling demand for satellites, missiles, combat jets was a death sentence for their firms. Terrified, the executives dashed from the meeting to set off one of the fastest transformations of any modern U.S. industry. Roughly 12 contractors merged into just four. One of them, a merger of Lockheed and Martin Marietta, would create the largest weapons company on planet Earth. These companies, now bursting at the seams and far too big to fail, began a race for new markets. Defense contractors are acting like globe-hopping diplomats to encourage the expansion of NATO, which will create a huge market for their wares, wrote Jeff Gerth and Tim Weiner for the New York Times. Billions of dollars are at stake in the next global arms bazaar, weapon sales to Central European nations invited to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Admission to the Western fraternity will bring political prestige, but at a price. Playing by NATO rules, which require Western weapons and equipment. We're talking real money. The prospect of NATO expansion was not popular with a large and growing sector of the American power elite. Notably, George Kennan, the legendary diplomat and historian, told the New York Times in 1997, expanding NATO would be the most fateful error of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era. That same year, a letter was drafted by a legion of foreign policy heavyweights. 46 signatories, including two former ambassadors to Moscow, former CIA Director Stansfield Turner, Sam Nunn, who led the Senate Armed Services Committee, Robert McNamara, and more. Serious, thoughtful people have doubts about the wisdom of expanding NATO a policy error of historic proportions. Despite these pleas, NATO expansion commenced, and by 1999, three new countries would be admitted, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. The next year, former CIA director Robert Gates criticized the pressing ahead with expansion of NATO eastward when Gorbachev and others were led to believe that wouldn't happen. One year later, the United States would unilaterally withdraw from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. I have concluded the ABM Treaty hinders our government's ability to develop ways to protect our people from future terrorists or rogue state missile attacks. This had long-term implications. In 2018, Russia unveiled a collection of nuclear weapons delivery systems, including missiles, torpedoes, and an intercontinental hypersonic glider built according to Vladimir Putin as a response to the demise of the ABM Treaty. And, writes the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, history appears to back him up. The glider, which has now been deployed, was first tested in about 2004, just two years after the U.S. withdrawal took effect. Also in 2004, NATO expansion reached another level, with the admission of seven more countries Arms sales and contracts flowed. Lockheed won a $3.5 billion sale of F-16s to Poland. As for Romania, the Textron Corporation secured a sale of $1.4 billion worth of Cobra attack helicopters to the impoverished country, in which, according to the World Bank, the majority of the poor live in traditional houses made of mud and straw, do not have access to piped water, and have no sewage facilities. After complaining that the country couldn't afford it, 
American officials reportedly told Finance Minister Daniel Dayanu this was the way to get easier access into NATO. Surely defense contractors also won when they furnished NATO with the bombs that poured into Serbia in 1999. Far from not moving over another inch toward the east, NATO had now cascaded 1,000 miles and now even bordered Russia. But still, NATO was not finished. With 10 countries being pulled into their orbit, NATO was about to absorb two more, and Russia had now reached a breaking point. The year was 2008, and NATO members had signed what is now known as the Bucharest Memorandum, in which they declared, NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agreed today that these countries will become members of NATO. So, in the likely event that this will be considered Russian propaganda, to assert that the very real prospect of NATO adoption of Ukraine may have led to the current war, consider the fact that U.S. officials have long held the same fear. While U.S. ambassador to Russia, current CIA director William Burns wrote in a cable, Ukraine and Georgia's NATO aspirations not only touch a raw nerve in Russia, they engender serious concerns about the consequences for stability in the region. Not only does Russia perceive encirclement and efforts to undermine Russia's influence in the region, but it also fears unpredictable and uncontrolled consequences which would seriously affect Russian security interests. Immediately after the 2022 invasion of Ukraine, Fiona Hill, formerly the senior director for Europe and Russia in the National Security Council, told Politico, and of course, four months after NATO's Bucharest summit, there was the invasion of Georgia. There wasn't an invasion of Ukraine then because the Ukrainian government pulled back from seeking NATO membership. We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals that will ensure a secure and prosperous and democratic Ukraine. 2014 would be a big year for Tory Newland, the former ambassador to NATO, former national security advisor to Dick Cheney, and the wife of neoconservative Robert Kagan. In 2013, she was appointed Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. Vladimir Putin, reacting to Newland's 2013 remarks, pressured Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych to accept an aid package worth $15 billion. The rest, as they say, is history. By then, two more countries were admitted into NATO, Albania and Croatia. Combined, the 12 post-Soviet NATO inductees had purchased $17 billion worth of American weaponry. A veritable torrent of arms and money sloshed back and forth from America to Eastern and Central Europe. With a new pro-Western government now leading Ukraine, the arms merchants set their sights. According to the Congressional Research Service, from 2014, when Russia first invaded Ukraine, through February 27, 2023, the United States has committed more than $42 billion in security assistance to help Ukraine preserve its territorial integrity, secure its borders, and improve interoperability with NATO. 2017 appears to be when things started to heat up, becoming a turning point for the crisis which directly led to the war. That year, the Trump administration reversed the U.S. policy on selling lethal weapons to Ukraine. It was only a matter of time until the situation started to spiral. And as the 2020s commenced, the U.S. and Russia were racing to the brink. In 2020, the U.S. and Estonian military conducted a live-fire exercise using M270 multiple launch rocket systems just 70 miles away from the Russian border. The Russian embassy in Washington called the exercise provocative and extremely dangerous for regional stability. Further, they asked, what signal do the NATO members want to send us? How would the Americans react in the event of such shooting by our military at the U.S. border? The Estonian defense minister replied with, Russia's criticism of the exercise shows that our eastern neighbor is following the exercise very closely. Seemingly encouraged by that fact, the exercise commenced the following year as well. In July of 2021, the U.S. and Ukraine hosted a naval exercise in the Black Sea called Operation Sea Breeze. 
During the exercise, the British HMS Defender coasted into what Russia considered its territory, prompting Russia to send planes. Putin threatened to sink it. Russia condemned the exercise as a provocation. In November, the Biden administration drafted a so-called Charter on Strategic Partnership with Ukraine, in which they boldly announced, guided by the April 3, 2008 Bucharest Summit Declaration, the United States supports Ukraine's right to decide its own future foreign policy course free from outside interference, including with respect to Ukraine's aspirations to join NATO. Signed by Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. When Russia mobilized to negotiate terms with the United States to get them to promise Ukraine wouldn't join NATO, no surprise it was him who declared, There is no change, there will be no change. And already by that point, Russia had deployed some 100,000 troops onto Ukraine's border, poised to invade when ordered. We reached our boiling point. Two months after the invasion, Reuters reported that the Pentagon asked the top eight weapons companies to meet to discuss the industry's capacity to meet Ukraine's weapons needs if the war with Russia lasts years. Further, planning for a longer war is expected to be discussed at the meeting. As we saw with Romania, this is par for the course, since buying Western arms is the way to get easier access into NATO. The defense establishment is riding the high of bountiful contracts and sales, and not just in Ukraine, but also NATO members in Europe. After the invasion, arms sales to NATO doubled. No doubt there are those who were eager to add Ukraine into the list of NATO clients, for reasons we can only speculate. No threat to Ukrainian sovereignty, Ukrainian lives, and indeed global security as a whole seemed too much to slow down the process of adopting Ukraine into NATO. Following the July 2023 NATO summit in Lithuania, in which they stated that Ukraine will join NATO, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg held a press conference where he detailed the plan. And at every summit since 2008, we have said uh, Ukraine will become a member. Uh, the next step is membership action plan. Now we remove that. So that's actually turning this process, which has always been two steps, into one step. That actually moves Ukraine closer to membership, and it's a significant difference from the 2008 uh, language. So this together with the fact that uh, the, the, the substantial delivery of, of equipment and training just by itself moves Ukraine closer to mem membership is a big, big difference. Will Ukraine and NATO make Europe safer? Make the world safer? What is at stake if the opposite is true? And the world is not safer. But like the escalation predating the war, the situation spirals even further. I don't like to think too hard on what that would mean for humanity. From the start of the 21st century and NATO's subsequent expansion, far from making Europe safer, battlegrounds have erupted, and now countless tens of thousands of lives have been extinguished. Is NATO serving to protect or to serve a narrow sector, interests that represent a tiny pool of humanity? And while war pays handsomely, the grand strategic prize is energy. NATO troops have to guard pipelines that transport oil and gas that is directed to the West. Who are they really protecting? And is it worth the fate of humanity in order to bolster their aims? I need your help. This channel relies on donations and patrons. Everyone, thanks so much for watching this video. If you want to support me and what I do, please consider becoming a patron. There are exclusive videos there. I accept donations through PayPal, Cash App. I also accept cryptocurrency. I accept Bitcoin and Ethereum donations. So please, if you want to support me, become a patron, give a donation. Uh, those are ways that you can support me. And of, of course, most of all, most importantly of all, please subscribe to the channel um, if you want to see more videos like this. Thank you so much. Take care. I love you so much.